Katarina von Hamessen. We actually have her birth, birth year, which is a little unusual, 1528, uh, and she died sometime after uh, 1587, which would be the last time that she's mentioned in a record. She was the daughter to the Antwerp painter Jan Sanders von Hamessen, uh, who's a fairly important 16th century painter. Uh, undoubtedly, he trained his daughter. And we have a number of signed paintings uh, by her, and I'm going to show you some of these. Uh, signed, dated. Uh, this one is a self-portrait. It's uh, signed and dated, uh, 1448. Uh, and in it, it says that she's 20 years old. Um, and we see her sitting at the easel uh, with her mall stick to steady her hand uh, as she draws a uh, face. Uh, with her uh, brushes and her uh, small palette. Uh, she's dressed very nicely, uh, velvet sleeves, for example. Uh, artists wanted to show their social status, too. I mean, today we think of an artist maybe putting on a smock and getting messy or grubby, uh, but they would never have painted themselves like that because they did have a social position to maintain. Uh, particularly, as we'll see, Katarina von Hamessen becomes a court painter. Uh, in 1554, uh, she married Christian de Morin, who was an organist at Antwerp Cathedral. And she, uh, in 1556, she moved to Spain. I said she was a court painter. She was a court painter to Mary of Hungary, who was the regent of the Netherlands. And in 1556, uh, Mary uh, abdicated. She decided to give up her position and move back to Spain. And so Katarina and her husband uh, both went with Mary and presumably uh, you know, continued to work for her uh, while they were in Spain. We know she was in Spain for two years, uh, 1556 to 58. When uh, Mary dies, uh, she leaves, when Mary dies, she leaves a bequest to Katarina and her husband, which ensures them a comfortable living, and they are able to move back to Antwerp, where presumably they live for the rest of their lives. This is another painting, uh, a woman at the Virginals, the Virginals, and sometimes you'll say at the woman at a spinet. Uh, I've seen it called both, and I'm not, I don't know my musical instruments well enough to, to distinguish between them. Uh, but here she is, a woman playing uh, uh, on the virginals or a spinet. And uh, the painting is signed and dated 1548, and it says that the, the sitter is age 22. Now, this certainly resembles Katarina in her uh, painting that we just saw. And she's dressed in a similar manner, but the age is wrong. Remember, Katarina's uh, painting said that she was age 20 in 1448, excuse me, 1548, there's a typo there, uh, she's, that Katarina was uh, 20 years old in 1548. So it's been suggested that this is her older sister. Now, the virginals are, uh, was a proper accomplishment for a woman uh, to show her musical ability. And also there was that association, the name the Virginals, uh, the, of the, the uh, instrument uh, with uh, a, a chaste young woman. Uh, this is another portrait uh, of a woman uh, here. She has a little lap dog. Uh, it's in the National Gallery in London. And once again, it's signed by uh, Katharina von Hamessen and dated 1551. And as you can see, she has uh, a very sensitive face here. This one's done with uh, some delicacy. Uh, it looks like she's become a more accomplished painter in those three years from 48 to 51. Um, the characterization of the face uh, is, is uh, striking. It's a somewhat uh, sensitive look. Uh, we see the beautiful highlights on the sle red sleeves uh, and a little, little dog who seems to uh, uh, be uh, beloved by her uh, mistress, so she's included in the portrait. Um, all of Katharina von Hamessen's portraits seem to have a dark background. They're not trying to put it in any particular setting, uh, just the figure standing out from the background. Now, I notice that the woman is fingering her belt and it has little beads on. It's possible, I would 
need to actually look at the work of art to make sure. It's possible that it could be rosary beads, or it could just be possible that um, the artist is giving her something to do with her hands uh, to make it a little bit more lifelike, a little bit more lively. As you can see, she's holding um, a rolled paper or parchment uh, in her other hands. For the most part, we usually think of Katharina von Hamessen as a portraitist, uh, because those are the paintings that she signed. But there are a few religious paintings which are also attributed to her, and I have pictures of a few of those, and I'll show you some. Uh, first, I want to show you the last dated painting by Katharina. Uh, this is a portrait of a man, uh, dated 1552, uh, which is in the London National Gallery. Uh, and as you can see, uh, see, it's in a similar sense to the, the women. You know, he's standing there in the three-quarter view, sort of a three-quarter length uh, view, um, with very elaborate sleeves, uh, some interest in the costuming, uh, and seems to be holding the hilt of a sword. Now, this is the last painting that we have with a date on it. So some people have suggested that she gave up painting when she married. Uh, however, remember, she is a court painter. She does go with uh, her, uh, her patron, uh, Mary of Hungary, uh, when Mary retires to the Spanish court. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that she gave up painting. Um, it could simply be that the paintings are lost or they are not attributed to her. There was at a later time a fire at the Spanish court that destroyed many paintings. So. Um, you know, it's, it's possible that she can, it's, I, it seems to me it's probable, but certainly we don't know, uh, it's, that she could have continued her painting. Now, there are other paintings that are attributed to her. Uh, this, is, this is a very beautiful painting, uh, and it's in the Baltimore County Museum of Art, and I was able to take some pictures of it, and I took some details, so I'll show you these. Uh, if this is by Katharina von Hamessen, it's certainly one of the most beautiful of her portraits and very, very sensitive, uh, with a lot of uh, interest not only on the face but also the decorative um, features and the textures of the clothing. So we're seeing her close up with these uh, chains around her neck, uh, the lace collar, uh, as I say, a beautiful sensitive uh, face with a, a beautiful headdress uh, with a lot of intricacy here. Uh, these paintings have also been attributed uh, to Katharina von Hamessen. And uh, I was interested, though, in, in finding out something about her religious paintings. Um, I've seen a list of places where they might be, but the only one I've been able to see was in the Cincinnati Museum of Art. Uh, this is a very large altarpiece, as you can see. It has uh, hinged wings and it opens. Uh, there's also paintings on the back of the uh, wings, of the shutters or the side panels. And it's attributed to the uh, Jan von Hamessen workshop, although uh, the hands in it, none, when we say something about the hands of it, we mean the artist hand who paints the painting. Um, none of the hands uh, in this are attributed to uh, Jan von Hamessen himself. It's known as the Tendilla altarpiece, and it's uh, suggested that there are four artists who are working on it. One who painted the outside wings, which you don't see. The other who painted uh, these uh, somewhat classicizing uh, figures of the uh, interior wings. Uh, another one who may be doing backgrounds. And Katharina von Hamessen. Uh, the center panels, these, uh, as you can see, there's uh, six paintings in the center. Uh, and the three paintings in the predella, or the lower portion of the panel, have all been attributed to Katharina von Hamessen. Now, the pictures aren't precisely clear because I'm taking this with a, uh, a handheld camera uh, before the digital age uh, and uh, having to push the, uh, the um, film to two stops. So uh, they're not as precise as we, we might like, but uh, you really find a hard time finding any pictures at all of uh, Katharina von Hamessen as uh, religious pictures. Even the latest book by her uh, doesn't uh, show any images of religious pictures by her. So we're looking here at these small pictures. As you can see at the top, there is a crucifixion. 
Uh, right below it is a picture of St. Jerome in the wilderness. Uh, Saint, the story of St. Jerome is that he went out of the wilderness and to um, uh, mortify his flesh, uh, he would beat on his chest with a rock, and you can see the rock in his hand. There's a skull at the bottom where he's contemplating his mortality, and of course uh, the crucifix in which he can, he can meditate. Here are two of the small uh, religious images. One is the ascension of Christ, and you see Mary in the center uh, with the apostles, and it seems like there's a whole crowd of people surrounding it. Um, although the Bible does not say that Mary was at the ascension of Christ, uh, most people assume that he wouldn't have left out his mother, uh, and so she's often very prominently placed. Uh, going back to, I can think of sixth century images where Mary is at the ascension right in the middle. You'll also notice how Christ is ascending. We see the Mount, the Mount of Olives from which he ascended at the top, and uh, we see his uh, aureole of light, uh, which is surrounding his feet. And his feet are sort of dangling down uh, from heaven as he, he goes up and is, is going up beyond the picture plane. Um, this actually was a tradition that you see in a lot of German art, uh, and sometimes they will even show the footprints of Christ uh, left on the mountaintop, which was a, a, a relic uh, that was reported from travelers that came back from the Holy Land. Uh, the other thing that has been suggested uh, as a reason for this type of image is that they did have, uh, in many churches, uh, on the day of the Ascension, uh, statues which would be winched up <laughs> into the, uh, the the dome or the uh, uh, rafters or you know, whatever your church configuration was, uh, and of course the last thing that the people seen below would be seen would be uh, the feet of Christ because as it's going up higher and higher, uh, sort of a, a um, demonstration or a, a little playlet using a um, an actual statue. Uh, rather than a, a human being in uh, sort of like a little demonstration. Katerina's style is not the finest style that you will see in the Netherlands. It's competent, and certainly you can see some of her influence of her father. If you look at the baptism of Christ, you can see uh, that Christ has been given fairly muscular arms. Uh, her father uh, and uh, her brother were, were famous for painting these uh, extremely uh, classicizing nude figures, uh, among other things. Um, and uh, so we see here the baptism of Christ uh, with a very energetic John the Baptist, a little God the Father floating uh, in the sky in an aureole of light, and uh, other people getting ready to be baptized, taking off the clothes. So there, that's a little classical motif. Uh, when I say classical, it's, it comes from the, the kind of tradition that we see with Italian Renaissance artists, which now has gone, come to Northern Europe. Uh, so in a sense, uh, showing some kind of interest in anatomy. Um, we also see a lamentation over the body of Christ uh, with uh, the, uh, and once again, I, I can see um, sort of the influence of, some, of, uh, of her father and some of the other artists uh, with these very solid figures. You see his Mary Magdalene weeping uh, with the draperies that, are, uh, that uh, show her, with the draperies that show the solidity of the form. And above this we see a little nativity uh, with Joseph actually uh, peering over the Christ child and uh, holding up the uh, uh, cloth. So a uh, very intimate view uh, with uh, a little more emphasis given to uh, the foster father of, of Christ, uh, as well as, of course, Mary. Uh, these are the predella, or the lowest part of the uh, painting. And we see uh, St. Saint, saint Sebastian, uh, the martyred saint. Uh, he's uh, being shot through with arrows. Uh, he was a good saint to call upon in times of plague. Uh, and once again, uh, the interest in anatomy that, is, that has uh, come to uh, Northern Europe and is, is prominent in her father's workshop. Uh, we also see the vision of St. Francis, uh, which shows uh, him receiving the stigmata. And uh, once again, uh, the, there's a, a bit of liveliness to the fact that Francis seems to be in action, uh, like he's uh, going down on his knees at that moment. Uh, in the center, we have these very solid uh, figures of the Virgin and 
St. Elizabeth, her cousin, and of course they're each feeling each other's stomachs here because at the visitation is when Mary visited St. Elizabeth and uh, Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist and Mary was uh, was pregnant with the Christ child, and it says in the Bible that uh, that John pays homage to Christ even in his uh, when they're both in their mother's wombs.